afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to today's lecture on the ancient Olympic Games. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're sprinting like Karoibos of Elis at the very first Stadion race. That is, sprinting from the logistics and organization of the Olympic Games to the actual events themselves. Now, along the way, we'll see the evolution of the Games, from the single foot race at the very first Olympics to the full-fledged plethora of events, including a variety of foot races, the pentathlon, combat sports, equestrian sports, and more. Now, in today's lecture, we'll take a look at what those events were, how they operated, and highlight a few of history's most memorable contests from Greek antiquity. Now, as you watch, try to get a sense for what's changed and what stayed the same as the Olympics shift from ancient to modern. So, whether you're looking to run your heart out or simply want to punch someone in the face, journey with me as we investigate the ancient Olympic Games. So let's begin by setting the scene. Now we've seen in previous lectures that the site of Olympia is first and foremost a religious sanctuary. The sacred precinct was known as the Altus, named after the sacred olive grove, and it contains temples to Zeus and to Hera, and also shrines and altars to Pelops, right, the founder of the games according to one myth, and to Zeus, and the Metroon, a shrine to the mother of the gods. And as archaeologists have excavated the site, they've been able to date many of these religious structures much farther back in time than any of the athletic structures. So again, the way to conceive of Olympia is as an important religious sanctuary where games eventually emerged as a ritual to honor the gods. Okay, so for today though, let's focus on the athletic structures themselves. Now at its core, the Olympic events took place in the stadion, right? What we're looking at right here. And this is the Greek term from which we get our word stadium. Now, the original, the earliest stadion at Olympia, it's no longer evident. It doesn't exist anymore. But archaeologists think that originally it would have extended all the way into the Altus so that you were very literally finishing your ritual athletic contest in front of the altar of Zeus. But again, the, the remains of that original stadion, they no longer exist. The stadion we do have dates to the early classical period, which is the early 5th century BCE. But even though we get our word stadium from this structure, the stadion in ancient Greece looked far less like a football stadium and much more like an elongated running track. It was around 200 meters in length and almost 30 meters wide, and you can still make out the original marble starting blocks where the runners would have begun their events. But other than that, it looks pretty empty. Now, all the Olympic events, except for the equestrian sports like horse and chariot racing, they would have taken place right here in the stadion. And spectators, something like 40 or 45,000 in total, they would have viewed the events from those grassy banks, right? Much like you can still see here today. So this isn't a matter of the stands having eroded over time or decayed over time. Rather, ancient Greek stadia, again, stadia is the plural of stadion, they were simply far less built up than we have in the modern day venues with things like stands and seats and bleachers, that sort of thing. So you can think of attending the games in antiquity like a nice picnic out with family and friends while you watched a few of the best uh, athletes in the world compete in their events. So let's focus on the structures we can see. 
So first of all, we have the monumental gateway entrance known as the Crypte. And this was built shortly after the Stadion itself. And it would have given the athletes and the judges and the magistrates a pretty sweet way to enter the arena of competition, really setting them apart from the other spectators. Then to the south side of the track, you can see this little rectangular stone area. And this was reserved seating for the judges. And the idea here is that this would both highlight the prestige of their role as judges and also give them a prime perspective to ensure fair play. The only other stone structure in the entire stadium is a small altar on the north side across from the judges box. And this altar was to Demeter Kamine. And this was the priestess of Demeter uh, who sat here and she was the only married woman allowed to witness the Olympic games. So fun fact here, Demeter Kamine is a composite again of uh, two different goddesses. So we have the pre-Greek pan uh, pantheon local goddess um, of agriculture known as Kamine, right? So Kamine was there in that region before the kind of traditional Greek pantheon arose. And then we've got the traditional Greek goddess uh, Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, and they get kind of merged together to form Demeter Kamine. And again, the priestess, the married priestess would have sat uh, on that stone uh, to watch the games. A great example of ancient traditions kind of extending into a, well, still ancient, but slightly yet less ancient world. Now, the only other athletic venue we have at Olympia is the Hippodrome. And the this was the location for horse and chariot racing. Now, the Hippodrome was located to the south of the Stadion. And while the Stadion is almost completely preserved, the Hippodrome is almost the opposite. It's almost completely lost. We have descriptions from Pausanias about particular attributes, like the turning post with the bronze statue of Hippodamia, the wife of Pelops who mythologically founded the games after that chariot race against Oina Mouse. And he also comments on the shrine to Taraxippus, the terrifier of horses. And that stood near the first turn in the race where there were a lot of crashes. And it kind of acknowledged how dangerous and terrifying the event must have been for everyone involved. But today, this area remains silent, buried within the sands of time. All right, so on to the main events, the ones actually included in the ancient Olympic games. So it all starts with the foot races just like it started with way back in the original Olympic Games. And the most basic of those foot races was known as the Stadion, establishing both the name of the race and the location where it was run. And for the first 50 years or so of the Olympics, the Stadion was not just the most famous event at the Olympics, it was the only event at the Olympics, just one single race. And the race itself was named after the distance it covered, so one Stadion or Stade, which was the equivalent of 600 ancient Greek feet. The only problem is that the length of a Greek foot, it differed in different parts of the Greek world. So estimates of the distance the race actually covered range from about 175 meters on the short end to 210 meters on the long end, with something around 185, 190 meters as kind of the most common distance for this race. But regardless of the exact length, it's clear that the Stadion was a sprint race, and that it was. The Stadion was the Olympics in the earliest days, right? It wasn't just an event at the Olympics. The Stadion was the Olympics in those early, early days. And in the very first Olympics, dating all the way back to 776 BCE, it was Koroibos of Elis, the nearest city-state, who won the Stadion race. And what an upset it was! Koroibos was recorded as being a mere cook and a baker and perhaps a butcher, but hardly an athlete. And now he's known forevermore as being the very first win winner of the very first Olympics ever recorded. Now, over time, other forms of foot races proliferated in addition to the traditional stadion. First, we've got the diaulos, which literally translates as the double flute. Now, why the double flute, you ask? Well, it's called the diaulos because it was an out and back race, one flute out, one flute back. And it was twice the length of the normal stadion. Now, from there, we get the Dolikos, which was a long distance race. And this varied between 20 and 24 lengths of the Stadion, which when you translate that into kind of modern distances, it would have been something between like a seven and nine K race, uh, something like five to six miles today. Now, finally, we see the merging of race with combat, right? 
Uh, and what we get is the Hoplito Dromos, where competitors would dress in full hoplite armor, often over 50 pounds of armor, and then run two lengths of the Stadion. And here, once again, we can see that like just like in the funeral games of Patroclus, the very, very close link between sport and warfare in ancient Greek society. So again, the big takeaway here is that the foot races were the original event of the ancient Olympic Games, and then this evolved into a larger diversity of events um, as time went on. Now, next up, we've got the pentathlon, a series of five events, but these were only judged as a whole. So there was just one winner for the whole thing. You didn't get a like kind of special prize if you just won the javelin. Anyway, uh, the setup here is a little weird. There were three events, the javelin and the discus and the broad jump, that only existed as part of the pentathlon. They weren't separate events themselves. So there were no individual winners there. Then the last two events were the sprint race and wrestling. But those were actual individual events. So competitors would just run the regular sprint race uh, and then their rank from that event would be transferred over to the pentathlon for ranking purposes. Now we're not 100% sure here, but scholars tend to think that it was the person who came in first in the greatest number of pentathlon events that was declared the ultimate winner. Oh, and while we're on it, uh, we once again see the link between war and sport with things like the javelin, right? Mimicking the battle spear that hoplites would have thrown and uh, held during phalanx warfare. Now the next event was the discus throw. And much like our information about how this took place comes from the sculpture we call the Discobolus. You've probably seen something like this before, uh, and that translates as the discus thrower. Now, the first one of these was sculpted by the sculptor Myron in the 5th century BCE, and it was very, very popular in antiquity, copied many, many times. And rather than the full rotation that we see throwers do today, right, where they're actually turning in complete circles, we get the sense that this was sort of a, almost a kind of underhand toss with a half rotation where the thrower led with the left leg. Now, in addition to letting us know how competitors actually threw, the Discobolus also represents kind of one of the pinnacles of Greek sculpture itself, demonstrating their ability to show tension and motion and fluidity in a sculpted medium as hard as stone. Now, the broad jump was the third of these events, and that also differed from the way that it's done in the modern world. So first off, there was the added component of the handheld weights that were used in the ancient Greek world. These were known as halteres, and these weights, what they would have done, they would have been held in the hands out in front of the body, and as the jumper leaped forward, he would then throw the weights back behind them, and that would propel the athlete forward even further. It's all physics here, right? Think every action as an equal and opposite reaction, throwing them backwards propels you forward. Now we also think that the ancient Greek long jump was a running broad jump, judging by the depictions on vases. Now, scholars still debate how the winner of the pentathlon was actually determined, whether he earned points for which place he came in in each event, or whether it just went to the person who came in first in the most events, regardless of where they came in in the others. What we do know is that if you won three out of the five events, if you won the majority of events, you were declared the winner right there. Now, one of the unique arguments is that uh, there was actually a process of elimination here, that you would hold the discus, and the javelin, and the long jump. And if somebody won all three of those, they were just victorious. And if we didn't have a winner in three of those, then you'd hold the foot races, right? Um, or you'd bring in the people from the foot races. And if that got you to three, then it was over. And then, if that didn't happen then, then you'd bring in uh, the combat sports, right? Um, and then if somebody won that, then it was over um, in the final event. So we still don't know how this worked for certain, but it's kind of an engaging theory nonetheless. All right, now after the pentathlon, there were a series of three different combat sports. And I know I sound like a broken record here, but this allows us to once again see the very close connection between warfare and sport in the ancient Greek world. So ancient Greek wrestling, similar to today, was scored based on a series of throws and takedowns and competitors would win by winning three out of five points. And those points were awarded for things like throws and takedowns, or they would win by getting their opponent to submit. 
And even though several things were banned in wrestling, we have historical evidence for athletes breaking those rules. Like one match where we have someone winning by breaking their opponent's fingers. Ouch. Anyway, boxing also would sound very familiar to the modern spectator. Uh, but boxing in the ancient Greek world was way more vicious than boxing today, which says a lot. So in ancient Greece, the sport only ended when somebody was knocked out or submitted by raising an index finger. Right? That's how you'd submit to the other person. Now, there were no weight classes, and most of the blows were directed at the opponent's head. At least as indicated by depictions on vases, right? That's kind of what we're basing that on. They're always punching each other in the head on those vases. Now, you combine that with the fact that you didn't wear any gloves, just some leather straps to make sure that you didn't break your knuckles when you're punching someone in the face, and you get a pretty brutal event. Now, all this violence can be seen both in the archaeological record and in the historical record. And one of the vases, um, are on vases and in sculptures, we can see boxers with broken noses and with cauliflower ears. And in the textual sources, we hear stories of boxers swallowing their own broken teeth to be able to continue fighting. So on the whole, there are similarities with today's sport, but it seems like a little bit more gruesome and violent way back then. Now, the last sport we've got is called the Pankration. Right? And this was the third, and it was the most violent of all the combat sports. This was sort of a mix between wrestling and boxing. Now, the Pankration was most similar to kind of modern MMA fighting, where kind of an anything goes list um, of different attacks was allowed. There were only two limits to this. First, no eye gouging. Second, no biting. So no eye gouging, no biting, anything else goes. Think about that for a second, right? Punching, kicking, choking, breaking fingers, breaking arms, breaking ankles, going for the groin, right? All of that is fair game. No eye gouging, no biting, anything else goes in this MMA style event. Now, we see a number of people getting seriously injured or even dying in this event. Basically, again, the MMA or the UFC of the ancient Greek world. And finally, we come to the equestrian sports, both horse and chariot racing. And to participate in these sports, we finally have to leave the confines of the stadion and head over to the hippodrome, the horse track. And just like with the foot races, we've got several different types of equestrian sports. So the major one was known as the Tethripon, which was the four horse chariot race. And this consisted of 12 laps around the hippodrome. Now, its younger sibling was known as the Sonoris, and this was the two-horse chariot race. And then finally, we can ditch the chariots altogether and just have our actual horse race, right? And when you're thinking of that, think of something like the Kentucky Derby here. Now, there are some slightly stranger sports involved as well, and in later times, we get something like a mule cart race known as the Apenne. And we're not really sure what that's all about, but you're racing mules and a cart. Now, apparently, there was also a cool event where men acrobatically dismounted from their horse and kind of gained style points for how cool their moves were before remounting the horse. Now, these were all the rage at the beginning of the 5th century BCE, but they were kind of discarded shortly after that, right? They thought, these are too newfangled, we don't want that, let's get back to the traditional events. I guess there just wasn't much of an audience for mule cart racing. Anyway, for the most part, these races were somewhat like modern horse races where a horse owner and a trainer sits in the stands, and then they watch the professional jockey, or kind of charioteer in this instance, actually drive their horses to victory. But even the charioteer one, right, it was nevertheless the owner, right, rather than the charioteer or jockey, who claimed victory in the event. So it's the person who owns the horse who gets the victory, not the person riding the horse or driving the chariot. But Pindar, the ancient Greek poet, he praises two owners in particular for driving their own chariots, right? So this was fairly rare, but apparently it happened on occasion. And he was very impressed because it was like the heroes of old, right? From like the Iliad, uh, gaining glory by doing the work themselves. Good for those crazy guys. Now, with the equestrian sports, we can also see the uh, relationship to war here as well, right? Chariots and increasingly popular cavalry would have been used in horse-based combat, um, as well as a connection and to ostentatious displays of wealth, right? So not only are you showing your abilities in war, you're also just showing how much money you have to, to raise these horses and construct these chariots. 
So horses were expensive in the ancient world, and these events gave Greek aristocrats kind of the, the chance to show off your wealth. So with that, our ancient Olympic events come to a close. Okay, so we saw today, uh, the Olympics began sometime around the 8th century BCE, traditionally 776, with a single event, the Stadion, or about the 200 meter sprint. But the ancient Olympics grew over time, and they increased in both the number of events and the groups who competed. Usually they were split up by age group. By the end, there were approximately 18 different events based on how you define the differences between them. Now, when we look at the modern world, the changes are enormous and immediate. So first of all, there are a whopping 441 events spread across the Summer and Winter Olympics. Compare that to the 18 in antiquity. But more than that, there's some serious difference in terms of who gets to participate and the types of things they're participating in. So in antiquity, only free Greek men who spoke the language and belonged to a Greek city-state were able to participate. Now, it's both men and women, a total of more than 14,000 of them from hundreds of countries across the world who come together to compete in the games. Now, we saw the relatively small number of categories in antiquity, right? Foot races, pentathlon, combat sports, equestrian sports. And those have absolutely exploded with the revival of the games. Now, for the first time, we have winter sports, we have water sports, we have ball sports, None of those existed at the Olympics in antiquity. And yet, despite the change in the number and the type of participants in these events, the essence still feels kind of refreshingly familiar. People from all across the known world coming together, from different governments, from different families, from different social groups, all coming together peacefully to compete for athletic glory and earn glory not just for themselves, but for their home state in front of their countrymen, in front of the gods. All right, you have made it through another lecture. Now, in today's lecture, we've attempted to break down the actual events of the ancient Olympics. And in doing so, we see that the Olympics didn't just appear full grown at the very first instance. Instead, it all started with a simple sprint, the stadion, before slowly evolving over time. And when we look at this, you get a sense for how these events can play a role in military training and in aristocratic social competition. Kind of a peaceful way for Greek city-states to both interact with each other and compete with each other for glory that perhaps didn't involve kind of the mortal bloodshed of warfare between Greek city-states. So next time you're watching the modern Olympics on TV, think back to how it all began. One guy, Koroibos of Elis, a mere cook and butcher and baker from a nearby town, taking the victory and the olive wreath. Just a few lessons you can learn from the ancient Olympic Games.